Did you ring, Professor? Ah, Tarleton, I did. In fact, I have been ringing for several minutes. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I, I didn't hear the bell. Oh, how distressing. Premature deafness and in one so young. Mm. Kindly pick up my book. Your book, sir? Yes, yes, it has fallen down beside the bed where I cannot oh, reach oh. it. Don't stand there gaping, girl. Oh, sorry, sir. Here, here you are. <laughs> and how was it you did not hear the bell? Where have you been? I was in the study, sir, taking your secretary a cup of tea. <laughs> and you stayed there, chattering to, <coughs> to him, no doubt. No, 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 no sir. <coughs> Mr Willoughby Smith was busy working. I wouldn't dream of disturbing him. <laughs> so you say, but I notice you spend too much time gossiping with that young man. Well, well sir, he always passes the time of day. He's very polite. He's a very nice gentleman. No, that's true enough. He's certainly a vast improvement upon his predecessor. The last man was worse than useless. I had to send him packing. Yes, sir, I remember. Mm. Now, when I found out he was delving into matters that did not concern him, I, I dismissed him out of hand. <laughs> I, I ordered him to leave my house at once. Please, <laughs> sir, you, you mustn't upset yourself. I will not allow anyone to poke and pry into my affairs. Do you understand? I will not allow it. The Golden Pansne by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Dramatised for radio by Peter Ling. With Clive Medicine as Sherlock Holmes and Michael Williams as Dr John Watson. And featuring Morris Denham as Professor Coram, Maureen O'Brien as The Strange Lady and Andrew Wincott as Inspector Hopkins. The Golden Fasnay. Ah, <sighs> oh, oh. You speak, Watson. No, no. Now my foot has gone to sleep. Oh, oh. Mm. Hardly surprising, as it's nearly midnight. Yeah, as late as that. No, I hadn't realised. We've been so engrossed in our work. Uh, what was it in the British Medical Journal that you found so absorbing? Oh, recent developments in kidney surgery. Oh. Mm. Yes, these new discoveries are always interesting. No doubt. Though ancient discoveries can be quite interesting too. Mm. You should take care not to overstrain your eyes, peering through that magnifying glass. Mm. Must be a fascinating document. Oh, I'm deciphering a medieval palimpsest. Yes, would you describe that as fascinating? Oh, of course. A medieval what? Palimpsest. A manuscript in which the original has been superimposed by more recent writing. Yes, I'm trying to uncover the buttery accounts from an obscure abbey during the second half of the 15th century. It's fascinating in its way, but... Uh, uh, you're perfectly right. I think I've done enough for one evening. <laughs> huh. Listen to that. The rain's worse than ever. Been sweeping in on the east wind ever since this morning. Uh, so now a cold, wet day has turned into a wild, tempestuous night when we can think ourselves lucky to be indoors. Uh, hello. What's that? Hmm? Uh, it's a cab making its way from the direction of um, Oxford Street and stopping at the curb. Uh, I spoke too soon. The man's getting out and hurrying to our door. What on earth can he want? Want? He wants us. And we, my poor Watson, will soon be wanting overcoat scarves and galoshes. Surely he can't be expecting us to turn out at this time of night. Uh, no, wait. Uh, the cab's setting off again, this hope, yeah. Uh, He'd have told the driver to wait if he wanted us to go with him. Mm. Run down to the door, my dear fellow. Mrs Hudson will have gone to her bed long ago. Inspector Hopkins. Is he in? Who is it, Watson? Uh, it's Inspector Hopkins. Do you realise it's almost midnight? Yes, I know. I'm sorry to intrude on you so late. But what but... are you waiting for? Bring him upstairs. Uh, well. <clears throat> After you, Inspector. Come in, my dear sir. Come in. I hope you've no designs upon us on such a night as this. Forgive me, Mr. Holmes. I know I shouldn't trespass on your valuable time. Oh, nonsense. 
Now, take off your coat and draw up a chair while I try to enliven the fire. Yes, I think with a little judicious attention, I may encourage these embers into a blaze. Yes, that's more like it. Yes, and the doctor has a prescription containing hot water and a lemon, among other ingredients, which is an excellent preventative medicine. Doctor, if you'd be so kind. I'm already preparing it, Holmes. Ah, it's very good of you, gentlemen. And I hesitate to trouble you with my problem. Well, it must be a serious problem indeed to have brought you out in this storm. I've had a very full day, Mr. Holmes, and that's a fact. Did you see the item about the Yoxley case in the evening edition? I'm afraid I've seen no news today later than the 15th century. Well, it was only a paragraph. Most of it wrong at that. You didn't miss much. <sighs> Inspector, an infallible remedy to be taken before bedtime. Oh, thank you, Doctor. You're very good health, gentlemen. Mm. And yours, Inspector. And here's to a speedy solution to the problem, whatever it may be. Ah, uh, that's better. Hmm? Well, well, I haven't let the grass grow under my feet, I promise you that. The crime occurred at midday, a few minutes before noon. I was wired for at 3.15, reached Yoxley Old Place by 5, conducted my investigations, returned to Charing Cross in the last train, and here I am. Yoxley Old Place. No, I don't recall the name. It's a manor house down in Kent, seven miles from Chatham, and not as near the railway station as I'd have liked. Mm. You say a crime was committed, but you don't specify what type of crime. Murder, Mr. Holmes. Plain and simple. Well, leastways, it's plain enough, but it's very far from simple. Here's a man dead. There's no denying that at any rate. But as far as I can see, there's no reason why anyone should wish him any harm. No motive, you see. None whatsoever. Allow me to correct you. There's no motive that you've been able to discover as yet. I suppose that's true. The fact is, I can't make head nor tail of it. Perhaps if you were to begin with the facts. Well, that won't be difficult. I've got the facts clear enough. All I want now is to make sense of them. Hmm. Well, let's begin with the, uh, the house. Yoxley, old place. Hmm? How old? Mm, very old. Originally built in the Middle Ages, I'd say. Tudor, or a bit earlier, maybe the 1400s. Yeah, strange how the 15th century seems to be pursuing me today. But a remarkable old building, by the sign of it. No doubt of that. A rabbit warren of rooms, winding passages leading up and down... Low ceilings and oak beams, very picturesque, unless you happen to be six foot tall. Yes, I noticed the bruise when you walked in. And who lives in this uh, picturesque rabbit warren? Well, some years ago, the house was taken by an elderly gentleman, Professor Coram. He's an invalid, keeping to his bed most of the time. Otherwise, he's wheeled in a bath chair by Mortimer, the gardener. Mm. What do his neighbours have to say of him? Is he popular? The neighbours have really set eyes on him. He never goes beyond the garden gate. He has the reputation of being a learned man, but a bit of a recluse. What other domestic staff does he have, apart from the gardener? There are two servants living in the house. Mortimer has his own cottage at the far end of the garden. Mrs Marker, the housekeeper, and a maid of all work, Susan Talton. Have these ladies been in his employ for long? He engaged them when he first moved in. They're both women of excellent character. He hired a secretary at the same time. He's writing some learned historical book, and he needs an educated young man to assist him. Ah, uh, and who is this educated young man? The professor hasn't been quite so fortunate in that respect. The first two he hired weren't successful, but the third, Mr Willoughby Smith, was a young chap straight down from university, and he filled the bill perfectly. I spent some time on the telephone this evening, and I can tell you, Smith was a decent, hard-working lad. What? Nobody ever had a bad word for him, from the time he was a schoolboy at Uppingham or a student at Cambridge. Yet he met his death this morning in the professor's study under circumstances which can only point to murder. Mm. Mm, that is certainly very curious. Mm. Uh, do you think, Holmes, uh, another log on the fire? Mm? Uh, yes, certainly. <coughs> now, to the murder itself. I am all attention, Inspector. The principal source of my information is Susan Tarleton, since she discovered the body. Mm. You say that, that the crime took place at midday. Where was Miss Tarleton at the time? Uh, just before noon. She was upstairs, hanging some curtains which she'd ironed at one of the windows in the upper corridor. Professor Coram was in bed as usual. When the weather's bad, he seldom rises before lunch. And Mrs Marker was busy in the kitchen. Willoughby Smith had been upstairs. He passed Susan Tarleton on his way down to the study on the ground floor. A minute or so later, she heard a dreadful cry from the room below. A wild scream, strange and unnatural. At the same instant, there was a heavy thud that seemed to shake the whole house. And then a silence. Mm. Girl must have been terrified. I'm sure she was. But she pulled herself together and ran downstairs. Oh, Mr. Smith. What's the matter? Are you all right? Uh, uh, 
Oh, what have has happened? Mr Smith, can you hear me? Uh, 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 oh, if I could just get you to a oh, chair. What was that not? <gasps> Heavens above! Oh, Mr Marker, thank goodness. I'm trying to lift him. Better not move him. I'll get some water. There's a crap on the table. We must get a doctor to him. I'll send Mortimer for Dr Parsons. Here you are. I tried to lift your head, sir. <gasps> oh, Lord! Oh, he's bleeding. It's only a small wound, but it's gone so deep. Oh. There's blood pouring from his neck. And look here. An open pen knife lying on the carpet. That's the one he uses for cutting string and chopping up ceiling wax. Oh, if only he could tell us how it happened. Try a few drops of water on his forehead. He's opening his eyes. He's trying to say something. <coughs> the proof, Professor. It was she. She? She was who? Oh, who? <coughs> oh, fact, a doctor. Oh, do worry. I'm afraid it's too late. I must go to the Professor. He'll have to be told. Mrs. Marker hurried to the professor's room and found him sitting up in bed, breathless and agitated. He had heard enough to realise that something terrible had happened. Breathless? Would there have been time for him to return to his own room and get into bed? He's an invalid. He can scarcely get around without his wheelchair. <laughs> I've known some ageing invalids who were not always as helpless as they seem to be. In this case, Doctor, his disability is genuine enough. Mrs. Marker said he was still in his nightclothes. He can't even dress himself without Mortimer's help. Mm, those last words, the Professor, it was she, they interest me very much. Did the housekeeper repeat them to Professor Coram? He could make nothing of them. He says they must have been uttered in some sort of delirium. He insists that Smith hadn't an enemy in the world. The crime could have no possible motive. So then what happened? The women called Mortimer and sent him for the police, and in due course the chief constable sent for me. When I arrived, the officer on duty took me to the study where I found the body lying in front of the bureau. That's how he was, sir. Nothing's been touched. And the stab wound? On the right side of the neck, just below the jaw. Severing the carotid artery. Yes, I see. You, uh, you don't suppose he could have done it himself, sir? By the look of it, I'd say that it was pretty well impossible. This blow was struck from the side and slightly behind. Hello? What's this? Clutched in his right hand. Oh, we didn't touch that either, sir, seeing as it might be evidence. And he was hanging on to it like grim death. Begging your pardon, sir. Hmm. Let's take a look. After I'd examined it, I wrapped it carefully in tissue paper, Mr. Holmes, and here it is. Uh -huh. A golden pince-nez. Hmm, with two broken ends of black silk cord attached to it. Did Willoughby Smith wear glasses? No, Doctor, he had excellent sight. There can be no doubt that this was snatched from the face of the assassin. Mm, mm, um, here. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I should like to try them on. <coughs> hmm. Oh, yes, quite so. No, no, <coughs> no, the pen and paper, I think. If we might return to the um, geography of the study, how many doors are there? Two. The first opens... Ah, of course. I beg your pardon, Holmes? Uh, are we interrupting you? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm just scribbling a few lines. Uh, carry on, by all means. You won't disturb me in the least. Well, if you're quite <laughs> sure... Uh... No, no, no. You were saying, Inspector. Mm. There are two doors in the study. The first opens onto a pair of narrow corridors, mm. one leading to the back door and the garden, the other to the professor's bedroom. And the second door? That's the door into the entrance hall, the front door and the main staircase. But the intruder couldn't have come in that way. Why not? That hall and staircase were in Susan Tarleton's view all the time. So our murderer must have come along the garden path and entered the house that way. The garden path? I imagine you examined it for footprints. Mm, yes, Doctor, and found nothing. That was when I realised I was dealing with someone cautious and cunning. Between the path and the long herbaceous border, there's a narrow strip of grass. There were no footprints on the path or the flower bed. The intruder had walked carefully along the grass in order to avoid leaving a trail. So there were footprints on the grass? Uh, not prints exactly, but the grass had been trodden down. I questioned Mortimer. He hadn't been working in the garden yesterday on account of the bad weather. Now, these tracks of the grass, were they coming or going? Um, Mr Holmes, I thought you were busy writing. It's not impossible to pay attention to two things at once. One well, inspector, coming or going? Uh, I couldn't tell. There were no clear outlines. It's a large foot or a small one. I couldn't even distinguish that. Yes, well, never mind. Can't be helped. Mm. At least we now know something about the lady we're seeking. The lady? Oh, here you are, Watson. Perhaps you'd care to read this, the hmm. fruits of my labours. Wanted. A woman of good appearance, attired like a lady. 
She has a remarkably broad nose with eyes set close on either side, a puckered forehead, a peering expression and probably rounded shoulders. She has had recourse to an optician at least twice during the last few months. As her glasses are of remarkable strength and opticians are not numerous, there shall be no difficulty in tracing her. <laughs> and now you're going to explain to us, no doubt. <laughs> Oh, my deductions were simplicity itself, that the owner of this pince-nez is a woman, I infer from its delicacy and elegance. And from the last words of the dying man, oh, presumably. Quite, yes. It's handsomely mounted in solid gold, so she's clearly a person of refinement and well-dressed. The clips are too wide for my nose, showing that hers must be unusually broad. My own face is narrow, yet I can't see through the centre of these lenses, so her eyes must be close-set. The lenses are also concave and of unusual strength. Anyone so short-sighted must have the physical characteristics that go with it. The frown, you know, the peering eyes, the head thrust forward. Yes, yes, well, I can appreciate that, but how do you arrive at her double trip to the optician? Oh, you notice that the, the clips are lined with tiny bands of cork, mm -hmm. one slightly discoloured and worn, though not more than a few months old, the other almost new. Obviously, it fell off and had to be replaced. And since they're evenly matched in size and style, we may assume that the lady went back to the same establishment for the replacement. By George, to think I had all that evidence in my hands and never knew it. I take it you plan to visit all the leading opticians? Uh, oh, uh, certainly. <clears throat> We've been inquiring after any strangers seen in the vicinity of Yoxley yesterday, or at the railway station, though without any success so far, I'm afraid. If it's not asking too much, Mr. You want Howard, us to visit Yoxley with you tomorrow? If you could... There's a train from Charing Cross to Chatham at six in the morning. Six? We change there for Yoxley Junction. We should reach Yoxley Old Place between eight and nine. We shall be on that train. Yes, the case has some intriguing features. We'll be delighted to accompany you, eh, Watson? Oh, delighted, absolutely. Yes, perhaps you'd be good enough to make up a bed on the sofa for the inspector. Then we can all have an early start. Yes, of course. Let's hope the gale blows itself out during the night. We've made good time. Not at all a bad journey. Ah, that's the local constable waiting for us. Morning, Langdon. Morning, Kent. Morning, Constable. Good morning. Well, now, any developments since I left? No, sir. I'm afraid not. Uh, nothing since last night. No reports of any strangers? Have you made inquiries at local inns and lodging houses? Yes, sir. There's no one in the district who can't be accounted for. Except the ticket collectors here work in a shift system. The man who was on duty yesterday knocked off at midday. And he won't be on again until noon today. Well, surely he could have been interviewed at home. No, sir. He went to stay overnight with a certain person in Maidstone. Nobody seems to know who she is. But she could be his married sister. Ah, let's hope so. Uh, well, in that case, there's nothing going to be done until he returns. Shall we proceed to the house? The garden looks refreshed after the rain. Still very damp underfoot. I take it this is the path you described? Yes, Doctor. It runs along the side of the house. Mm. Uh, washed clean, of course, during the storm. All the same, I'll take my oath. There were no footprints on the path yesterday, Mr Holmes. And the marks on the grass? They're along here. Well, they were. The grass has sprung up again. Yes, I can still see a few traces. Yes, someone certainly passed this way. Yeah, the lady must have trodden carefully. One false step and she would have left a print on the path or in the soft earth of the flower bed. Like I said, she must have been very cautious. Certainly, a remarkable performance. Remarkable. Uh, the back door, is it usually left open? Oh, yes. Country folk don't bother much with bolts and bars. Oh, so our visitor had nothing to do but walk in. Ah, very well. Let's follow her example. I'd like to have a few words with the staff. Mr Holmes, this is the housekeeper, Mrs Marker. I'm very pleased to meet you, Mrs Marker. This is my colleague, Dr Watson. How do you do, Mrs Marker? Good morning, gentlemen. It's very good of you to assist us in our investigation. Well, sir, we want to find out who did such a terrible thing. That poor Mr Smith, such a respectable gentleman he was, he wouldn't hurt a fly. Whoever attacked him must have been a wicked, wicked man. Not necessarily. I believe it was a woman. Oh. And when she entered the house, I don't think murder was in her mind. What makes you say that? Well, if it had been, she would have provided herself with some sort of weapon instead of having to pick up this knife from the bureau, which is where the young man generally worked, is it? Yes, sir. So, our visitor made her way in from the garden and found herself in the study. 
Of course, we've no means of knowing how long she was here, but... Excuse me, sir, hmm? but I think I can tell you that. Oh? It, it can't have been more than a few minutes, because I was in here myself, dusting and tidying, not long before, not above a quarter of an hour at the most. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs Marker. That narrows it down. Uh, so, she enters the room and goes to the bureau. Not to the upper part, for that was open with a flap down, but to the drawers below, which are kept locked. Hello, what's this? Inspector, did you notice this scratch? I saw it, Mr Holmes, but there's nothing uncommon about that. You often find scratches round a keyhole. Yes, but this one goes across the wood, too. It's very recent. See how the brass shines where it's cut? Mrs Marker, did you dust the bureau yesterday morning? Yes, sir. Did you notice the scratch? Oh, no, sir, I didn't. Yes, I'm sure you didn't, because it hadn't happened then. Ah. Who has the key to this drawer? The professor keeps it himself. Mm, that's right. Professor Coram lent me his key, and we went through the desk together, checking the contents. There's nothing missing, he assured me on that point. I see. Now, Mrs Marker, I wonder if I might talk to your young companion, Miss Susan Tarleton? I promise you, my dear, there's nothing to be afraid of. Mr Holmes just wants to ask you a few questions. Yes, sir. Anything you can tell us may be extremely helpful. Now, so far, we've established that an unknown lady entered this room yesterday morning and either unlocked this bureau or tried to do so. Oh, begging your pardon, sir, but she couldn't have... There's only the one key, and uh, Professor keeps that on his watch chain. Well, then perhaps she'd got hold of a duplicate. Now, let's imagine the scene. While she's thus engaged, Mr Willoughby Smith enters the room. In her panic, her key scratches the drawer. Smith seizes her. She grabs the knife to defend herself. She strikes at him, and the blow proves to be fatal. Oh, hmm? oh sir, I, I hear them cry out. Now, it's all right. Don't distress yourself. Not no, really, Holmes. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. It was all over in a moment, and she made her escape. Uh, tell me, Miss Tarleton, could she have got away? way through the hall and out by the front door? No, no, sir, she couldn't. I'd have seen her from the top of the stairs. Thank you. That rules out one possibility. Now, I understand this other door opens onto a pair of corridors. Hmm? Yes, sir. One of them leads straight to the professor's room. She couldn't have got out that way. So she must have gone the other way, through the back door and the garden, the way she came in. How very odd. What's odd about it? Seems the obvious thing to do. Yes, one might think so, certainly, but... Uh... Uh, Miss Tarleton, would you mind taking us to Professor Coram's room? Yes, sir. If you just follow me. Thank you. Yes, I'm uh, anxious to make the Professor's acquaintance. Uh, this way, sir. Uh, that's the way to the back door. Hmm? Oh, yes. Hmm. Yes, coconut matting in both corridors. Does that have any bearing upon the case? Yes, possibly. I, I don't insist upon it. I may be wrong. Yet it seems to be suggestive. Here we are, sir. Hmm? Come in. Mr Sherlock Holmes hmm. and Dr Watson, sir. Ah, oh, come in, <coughs> gentlemen. <coughs> this is a rare privilege. <laughs> I meet so few people nowadays. Thank you, Tarleton. That'll be all. Very good, sir. It is a pleasure to meet you, though. I'm sorry it must be under these unhappy circumstances. <coughs> you must excuse my... My doctor tells me I spoke too much. Are you a smoker, Mr Holmes? I am indeed, though I generally prefer a pipe. Oh, but you must sample one of my Russian cigarettes. They are specially packed and dispatched to me. Yeah. And, and you, my dear sir, I can recommend them. Yeah, thank you. They look rather exotic. Mm. <laughs> exotic and exquisite. I have a fresh supply delivered every fortnight. <laughs> it's bad for me, no doubt, but an old man has few pleasures. Watson? Hmm. <laughs> Ah, well, yes, I... <clears throat> I commend your taste in tobacco, Professor. <laughs> yes, tobacco and my work. They were all I had left, and now only tobacco remains, alas. Yeah, but your work? <laughs> How can I work without that estimable young man? After a few months' training, he had become an invaluable assistant. Such a fatal interruption, such a <laughs> catastrophe. <laughs> What do you uh, think of this sad business, Mr Holmes? I haven't yet made up my mind. Ah, uh, well, if you can throw any light upon it, I shall be in your debt. To a bookworm, an invalid like myself, it is a paralysing blow. I seem to have lost the power of thought. Oh, I'm sure, Professor, that when you've recovered from the shock, 
Mm. You'll find your powers returning to you. No. Then you'll be able to continue your literary work. Sure, I wish I could be so optimistic. You see that great pile of papers on the side table? <laughs> Those are but the rough outline of my magnum opus. So much still to be done. I, I'm an old man. You, uh, <clears throat> you study history, I understand. Ah, yes, my book is an analysis of documents found in the Coptic monasteries of Syria and Egypt. It will strike at the very foundations of revealed religion. But your reading is not entirely confined to the past. I notice from your shelves you keep abreast of contemporary fiction as well. You know, crime and Punishment, Anna Karenina. Mm. You enjoy Russian literature as well as Russian cigarettes. No, I, I divert myself with novels. I do not always enjoy them. Have you read Anna Karenina, Mr. Holmes? <laughs> A shameful book. The so-called heroine is shallow and worthless and a faithless wife. I could not be bothered to finish reading it. Uh, forgive me, but I, I wonder, might I trouble you for another cigarette? Oh, dear me, you are an even quicker smoker than I am myself. <laughs> I am a connoisseur. Thank you. Mm. Uh, no doubt you have many questions to ask me, Mr Holmes. Am I to be subjected to a, a cross-examination? I shan't trouble you long, Professor, since I understand you were in bed when the crime was committed and can tell me nothing about it. But just, just let me ask you this. What do you imagine the young man meant when he breathed his last words, the Professor, it was she? Oh, my dear sir, Tarleton is a country girl with the usual stupidity of her class. Smith may have babbled some incoherent words. She has twisted them into that meaningless message. So, you have no explanation of the tragedy? <laughs> Possibly an accident. Or perhaps between ourselves, you understand, suicide. Young men have their secret troubles. <laughs> An affair of the heart, perhaps, that we never suspected. But the eyeglasses. No. <laughs> We are aware, are we not, that love objects may take strange shapes? A fan, a glove, a pince nez. Who knows what may be treated as a token when a lover puts an end to his life? No, no, I, I feel certain Willoughby Smith met his fate at his own hand. Yes. And one more question, Professor. What are the documents you keep locked in the Bureau? Oh, nothing to interest anyone but myself. Family papers, souvenirs of the past, letters from my poor wife. But here, here's the key. You may examine it for yourself. The key? Ah, oh, yes. yes. Oh, thank you, Professor, but I hardly think that would help me. Mm. Well, I apologise for having trespassed upon your time. We shan't disturb you for a while. Uh. At two o'clock, we'll come back and report to you upon any further developments. Mm. Uh, oh, oh uh, before I go... I would enjoy another of those excellent cigarettes. <laughs> by all means, by all means. It's a pleasure to see how you appreciate them. Oh, fresh air at last. For my word, Holmes, I've never known you to smoke so many cigarettes. One was enough for me. It was not for my pleasure, I assure you. They might help to unravel the mystery. Ah, you mean the cigarettes were a clue of some sort? Well, it's possible that I'm completely mistaken. If so, there's no harm done. We have the opticians to fall back on. But I, I'd like to take a short cut when I can. Ah, the excellent Mrs. Marker. Excuse me, gentlemen. I've been preparing luncheon for you in the dining room. It's only a cold collation, some roast beef and salad, but you're very welcome. That's more than kind of you. I'm sure Dr. Watson will do it justice, though I fear I'm not very hungry. I've been smoking too much. Not as much as the professor, I hope, sir. He puffs away like a chimney, all day and half the night as well. When I take in his breakfast of a morning, you'd think it was a London fog. And sometimes he's that cantankerous. Oh, but I shouldn't say that. I, I know it's his illness makes him awkward now and then. And I suppose he eats next to nothing. Well, he's variable, as you might say. I'll wager he took no breakfast this morning, and I dare say he won't be able to face lunch, either. Hmm? You're wrong there, sir. He ate a very hearty breakfast today and ordered a remarkably big lunch, too. Ah. It quite surprised me. I mean, what with poor Mr Smith and all, I don't know how he can bear to look at food. Oh, by the way, sir, 
I've taken the liberty of asking Inspector Hopkins if he'd care to join you for luncheon. I hope you won't have any objection. <sighs> the ticket collector reported for work promptly at 12 noon, Mr Holmes. And your theory about the woman proved to be correct. Uh, uh, the woman, yes, quite so. Yeah. The one in Maidstone? She's not his married sister. Well, I, uh, I didn't inquire as to that, sir. I meant uh, the theory about the strange lady. She arrived on the 10.43 from Chatham yesterday morning. The ticket collector was able to give us a pretty good description. Smartly dressed, close-set eyes, and wearing a gold pince-nez. Mm, well done, Holmes. You were absolutely right. What's more, she was on her way to this house. She asked for directions. I see, I see. Thank you. Well, you must feel a little gratified, surely. Why? It's no more than I expected. Uh, uh, yes, Susan, what is it? Would you care for a little more beef, sir? Ah, uh, thank you, no. Uh, by the way, do you happen to know if Mr Smith left the house at all yesterday morning? Uh, yes, sir, he did. He went out for a walk. He said he wanted to make the most of the weather because the barometer was falling. Mm. Was he out for very long? No, sir, not long. And he got back about half an hour before... Uh, well, before, before it uh, happened. Yes, thank you, Susan. Thank you very much indeed. Well, it's two o'clock. Let us go and have it out with our friend, the Professor. Uh, come in, gentlemen. <coughs> Mr Holmes, may I offer you another cigarette? Uh, no, thank you. I think I've smoked enough for one day. <laughs> As you wish. And what have you to tell me? Have you solved the mystery yet? Yes, yes, I, uh, I have solved it. Good heavens. Solved it? <laughs> While you were strolling in the garden? Over lunch, perhaps? No, no, I, I solved it in this room. A moment ago. Now, if you're joking, Mr Holmes, I must tell you this is too serious a matter for flippancy. Uh, may I uh, reconstruct the case for you? Uh, there's a, a little information I still require. Uh, you may be able to provide it. Well, I cannot imagine how, but... Of course, anything you wish to know. Hmm. Well, let me tell you what I know already. Yesterday morning, a lady entered your study with the intention of removing some documents from your bureau. She had her own key. Now, when you were good enough to let me examine your key, I did not find those marks upon it which the scratch on the keyhole would have produced. Uh. Therefore, I deduce that the lady came here without your knowledge in order to rob you. Oh, this is most interesting and instructive, but... Well, what became of your mysterious lady who appears to have vanished? She was discovered by your secretary, and in her frenzy, she stabbed him. Horrified by what she'd done, she fled from the room, but during the struggle, she had lost her pince-nez, and being very short-sighted, she was helpless without them. Instead of turning into the right-hand corridor, heading for the back door and the garden, she went the other way, with coconut matting in both corridors. It was an easy mistake to make. When she pushed open the door in front of her, she found herself in this room. <laughs> it's, it's a fine theory, Mr Holmes, with one small flaw. I was in this room all day and never left it. Yes, I know that. Perhaps I was asleep at the time. Otherwise, I could hardly fail to be aware of a stranger entering my room. She was not a stranger to you. And you were aware of her. You spoke to her. You helped her to escape. Are you mad? I helped her to escape? Well, where is she now? Perhaps you'd be good enough to leave your hiding place, madam, and join us. No, 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 I must insist that... The bookcase! Good gracious! You are right, sir. Perfectly right. I am here, and I am your prisoner. My dear lady, won't you come and sit down? I'm afraid you're far from well. I am well enough to tell you the full... Oh, excuse me, I did not see the footstool. Allow me to return your pince to you, madam. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You know so much already. You have discovered the truth. And I must own to everything. It was I who killed the young man. In my terror, I snatched up the first thing that came to hand and struck at him. I did not know it was a knife. That is the truth. I swear it. Please, madam, be seated. Here, be seated. There. Now, thank you. Take time to compose yourself. We are in no hurry. I am obliged to you, gentlemen. And I wish that you should know my story. I am a Russian. 
And so is Sergius. His full name, I will not tell you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Ella. I am in your hands. But why should you cling so hard to your wretched life? It has done harm to many and good to none. Not even yourself. Mm. I am this man's wife. Ah. He was 50 and I a foolish girl of 20 when we met. He was my tutor at the university. I will not name the city. May we know why? Sergius could be traced. I should not wish that. Oh, thank you, my dear. Yes, very well. Please continue. We were revolutionaries, anarchists. He and I and many more. Then came a time of great trouble. A police officer was killed. Many were arrested. And to save his own skin and gain a reward, this man betrayed his companions and his wife also. No, no, it was a misunderstanding. We I... were arrested. Some of us went before the firing squad. Some, like me, to Siberia. I was fortunate my term was not for life. Sergius fled to England and has lived here quietly ever since, knowing that if the Brotherhood learn where he is, justice will surely follow. No, but I trust you, Anna. You were always good to me. Let me finish. Among our comrades, there was one who was... the friend of my heart. He was noble, unselfish, loving, all that my husband was not. The others were ruthless and dangerous men, but Alexis was not. He hated violence. He wrote many letters to me, trying to dissuade me from our plan of action. Those letters would have saved him. And so would my diary, where I poured out the secrets of my heart, my love for Alexis, my hatred of Sergius. No, no. When we were arrested... My husband here found the diary and the letters. He hid them and lied to the police, swearing away the young man's life. Alexis was sent to Siberia, where he remains to this day, working in a salt mine. Think of that. Alexis lives like a slave while the life of Sergius is in my hands. And I am letting him go. You were always a noble woman, Anna. Yeah. When I was released, I followed him to England. After months of searching, I discovered where he lived. I knew he had the diary and the letters, and I was determined to find them. I employed a private detective who entered this house as a secretary. Hmm? Yes, yeah. your second secretary, sir, just the one who left so hurriedly. <sighs> He refused to steal the documents for me, but he made an impression of the key to the bureau and the plan of the house. So I came to find the documents myself. I had just taken them from the drawer when the young man discovered me. A little earlier, I had met him walking in the country lanes. Never guessing who he was, I asked him the way to this house. Exactly. Smith returned and told you, Professor, about the lady he'd met. Mm. That is why, with his dying breath, he tried to send you a message that it was she. The she you'd been discussing. When I found myself face to face with my husband, I told him that if he handed me over to the law, I would give him up to the Brotherhood. For that reason alone, he agreed to shield me. He introduced me to that dark hiding place and showed me the trick of the lock. It is a relic from the religious wars, a priest's soul, known to no one but myself. Since he takes his meals in this room, he was able to give me food. It was agreed that when the police abandoned their inquiries, I, I would slip away by night, never to return. But now the inquiries are concluded, and I fear that your circumstances have changed. The inspector has to do his duty. I'm sorry, madam. 
I must warn you, you are under arrest. You will accompany me to London to make a formal confession at Scotland Yard. I am ready to do what must be done. No, Anna, wait. Farewell, Sergius. And may the God in whom you do not believe have mercy upon your soul. Although you do not know us, madam, my colleague and I will be happy to present your case before the authorities. The death of Smith was accidental. We can testify to that. No, I do not know you. But I know you are good men, and I trust you. That is why I ask you to take charge of these documents. The diary, the letters, these will save Alexis. I confide them to your honor and your love of justice. You will deliver them to the Russian embassy for me. And this is all that must be done. But, madam, you will need these documents as evidence in your own defense. I need nothing. Please do as I say. These are my last words. Watson, Hawkins, stop her! Dear God. It's a simple case, yet in some ways an instructive one. Mm. It turned upon Pantene, of course. Yes, of course. Without it, you might never have reached the solution. And if the unhappy woman hadn't been short-sighted, she might have found her way to the back door and made her escape. Yes, you're right to believe that without her Pantene, she left the house and walked along that narrow strip of grass, never making one false step. I called it a remarkable performance. I should have said an impossible one. Yes, I therefore reached the conclusion that she must have remained within the house. When I realised the similarity between the two corridors, it became clear that she had entered the professor's room. Ah, oh, yes. I seem to remember when we left the study, you took a few steps in the wrong direction yourself, didn't you? Yes, I may have done. It was an easy mistake to make. Yes. Yes, but, uh, thank you for reminding me, Watson. Oh, don't mention it. There's only one small point I don't quite understand. Really? What's that? How did you know about the secret hiding place? Hmm. I didn't know. But I examined the room carefully and saw that although there were piles of books everywhere else on the floor, a space had been left clear in front of the tall bookcase. So I smoked as many cigarettes as possible and scattered the ash. Mm -hmm. It was a simple, simple trick, but mm. effective. Now, when we returned after lunch, I saw from the traces on the carpet that in our absence the lady had come out of her retreat. Eh, poor creature. Mm. I suppose you couldn't face the ordeal ahead of her in London. No doubt when she heard the train coming... She decided to take her own life. Oh, I think she'd been planning it for some time. And it was her husband who unwittingly put the idea into her head. When he talked of Anna Karenina, knowing she could hear everything he said, he couldn't resist the chance to vilify the heroine, the faithless wife, the worthless creature. Mm. Uh, if he'd troubled to finish reading the novel, he'd have known that in the closing page, Anna throws herself under a train. I did my best to stop her, but... Oh, she was quite determined. At this moment, Hopkins will be at Scotland Yard, making his report, doing his duty. And tomorrow, hmm? we must do ours. Tomorrow? Tomorrow, Watson, you and I will drive together to the Russian embassy so that, God willing, an innocent man may be set free. In The Golden Fasnay, Sherlock Holmes was played by Clive Merrison and Dr. Watson by Michael Williams, with Morris Denham as Professor Corum and Maureen O'Brien as the strange lady. Inspector Hopkins was played by Andrew Wincott, Mrs. Marker by Linda Polan, Susan Tarleton by Federer Holmes, and Constable Langdon by James Telfer. The violinist was Leonard Friedman. The Golden Pansnay was dramatised for radio by Peter Ling and directed by Enid Williams. <laughs>